we were an early adopter of version 6 Unix here, yeah. and we had a fax and PDP 11s and all that stuff. And so we were happy to run Unix, and I was teaching a course on operating systems using uh, version 6 Unix, and John Lyons of Australia wrote a little book sort of describing it line by line, and it was very popular at universities. And uh, the bean counters at AT&T decided this was a bad idea, that you know, having every student in the world learn about their product, which, you know, which they owned, uh, they thought was a horrible idea. So with version 7 came with a license saying, thou shalt not teach. Okay, so the version 7 license said you couldn't teach version 7 Unix anymore, which was, it's got to be up there, ranking up there, or something Xerox did as, you know, the dumbest mistake in all of history. But um, they did that. So we couldn't teach Unix anymore. I said, maybe I'll write my own operating system, which is compatible with V7, and then I can teach it. I sat down, and I began writing, and now it, it sort of worked. I got it almost to the point where it worked. And um, it was crashing at random. But it was all, all the functionality was there, and it would run for you know, 15 minutes, and then it would crash. And you know, I was like about to give up. I just couldn't, you know. So I said, I, you know, I'll do. I'll write a simulator for the PC, and I'll run on the simulator because that's entirely deterministic and reproducible. And then after it crashes, I can go run it again and print out the last hundred thousand instructions, find out what happened. So I wrote, I wrote the simulator. It took me a little while, but. I got it running. So I had a complete simulator for the PC. If I had been smart, I would have invented VMware. This is, you know, in the, in the 80s, because I already, you know, I'd done basically the work. I could have done translation instead of interpretation, but I didn't think it would, you know. So I wrote a PC simulator. Anybody could do that. So I didn't care. So it worked perfectly on the simulator. It would run forever. It would never, it wouldn't run on the hardware. It only ran the simulator. And I'm kind of scratching my head from, gee, how come? One of my students, Robert from NASA, mentioned to me sort of, I was explaining this prompt, mentioned me offhand, you know, um, when the Intel chip gets hot, it gives interrupt 15. And I said, no, it doesn't. And he said, yeah, I heard that somewhere. I said, the manual doesn't mention anything about that. And so I said, well, I don't know. I can, I can put in a test. I, can, I, I wasn't catching interrupt 15, of course, because the manual didn't mention it existed. So I put in a little piece of code which caught interrupt 15. And sure enough, within an hour of running it, I get this message, hi, I'm interrupt 15. This is impossible. You'll never see this message. So I was saying all these very unpleasant things, which I cannot repeat about you know, the internet about Intel from, if they want to put a thermal sensor, great, please put it in the manual though, you know, mention it. So I, I put it in and all of a sudden Minix worked, okay? If Robert hadn't made that comment, there would have been no Minix. If there were no Minix, there'd be no Linux because Linus went out and bought a PC specifically for the purpose of running Minix. He was in the Minix news group. He had a big news group on, on the, you know, using that news groups. Um, he, you know, spent a lot of time developing Linux based on Minix. He changed this, he changed that, and eventually it changed almost everything. And so it, it sort of launched as its own system. So if Robert hadn't made that comment, there would have been no Minix, there would have been no Linux. If there had been no Linux, there would have been no Android, because the Android is Linux, okay? And if there had been no Android, the relative stock prices of Samsung and Apple would have been quite different, because the Apple is based on iOS, which is FreeBSD, which came from a whole different strain of Unix. So that wouldn't have been affected by the presence or absence of Linux. But Robert's remark ultimately changed you know, billions of dollars of valuation in the Samsung versus Apple stock prices. And if he hadn't made that, the world would be quite different. There probably wouldn't have been an Android. And you know, heaven knows what all the other things that depend on you know, Linux and Android. All I mean, the server bits of all of that. I mean, too. all the server parts. Of that. I mean, they might have been using FreeBSD or something instead. Who knows? But you know, the world, you know, that one little offhand remark you know, had all these consequences downstream. So then how did, how, so so did anyway, you write Minix then the, write the book? Yeah, I wrote Minix and then I wanted to document it because I wanted something like Lion's book, you know, which explained in a course. So the, the book, you know, most of the chapters have three sections. One is sort of the general principles of file systems or process management, whatever. The second part is how these general principles apply to Minix. You know, what is the memory management algorithm? How is the file system organized? And what are the key data structures? And so on. And the third part of every chapter is, now we're going to look at the code. Here on line 10,720, we see the main headers for the file system. And here we're declaring you know, these headers. And now on line 14,000, we're starting with the actual main loop of the file system. And it goes and gets a request. And it takes it apart. There's a switch statement. It figures out what to do. And you know, so it goes through the code bit by bit. So it was you know, like Lion's code. And, and the book came with um, a bunch of floppy disks, which was the only transport medium in those days, where you actually had the source code. And so the book came out, it was an enormous uh, success. And at the same time, it was already BSD, which was a, a mature, stable working system, which had 20 years of background, uh, the VAX and the PDP-11. And the guys who formed it, you know, McCusick and so on, um, they formed a company, uh, BSD Incorporated, and they were trying 
to, uh, to sell it commercially. And their phone number was 1-800-IT'S-UNIX. And so what does AT&T do? Again, in one of the more brilliant commercial moves in all of history, they sued BSDI to, to get rid of them. And they had no knowledge at all how to sell Unix. If anybody there had an IQ of above about, you know, say, two-digit numbers, they would have gone to the BSDI guys and say, we want to buy your company how much? And given your AT&T, the biggest corporation in the world, no matter what number they had mentioned, we would have said, good, sign here. And they would have had the BSDI guys sell Unix. It would have been, there would have been no MS-DOS. There would have been no Windows. It would have been all Unix, you know. And they try to stop these guys. So BSD was blocked from going commercial. And I, I knew about this. And so I didn't want to make Minix like big commercial things. So I figured the BSD guys eventually are going to go out there. And that's a stable, mature system with many programmers and many users, many all software. That would take over the commercial aspect of this you know, free software world. But it didn't because of the stupid lawsuit from AT&T. And so that was the, the interval that Linux got you know, a chance to grow. So you know, one of the, again, one of those freaky, you know, I said that the bean cutter at AT&T who sued these guys instead of buying the company and saying, you're our marketing division, go sell it. <sighs> but at the same time, if you think about Minix, it let Minix, the Linux <coughs> movement yeah. let Minix stay for teaching and education. For a while, yeah, we've, we've changed that recently. Okay. You know, I got an, uh, one of these, the European Union, they decided to set up a couple of new programs where basically they would, um, you know, give a large chunk of money about two and a half million euro, which is, I don't know, three and a half or four million dollars, to one specific investigator. Uh, there's two, two categories, young investigators who just sort of getting started, and senior ones who have a track record. And basically, let them go do their thing. And I applied for this, and I got one of them. And with this ERC advance grant, we're trying to go commercial you know, with Minix. We, we're pushing it in the area of uh, embedded systems and high reliability, because it's you know, got a kernel and all these servers that run separately in user space as user mode processes. And in particular, if one of them crashes, there's a reasonable chance we can repair it on the fly without disturbing running programs. You know? And so if the disk driver fails, we can detect that. We can start up another disk driver, and there's a glitch of you know, I don't know, a couple hundred milliseconds while we're restarting things. But things go on. If the um, disk driver in Linux crashes, that's the end of Linux. Okay? You have to reboot the whole computer. So we think there might be a little niche in there. I think there's a significant niche, actually. I think yeah. that uh, the problem with <coughs> modern operating systems is they're getting too large yeah. and too complex. Yeah, and this breaks up into little. Validate. Yeah, this breaks up into little pieces. And another thing which we can do now, and the the um, you know just before we started, uh, one of my PhD students came in. He's working on a live update, so we can update almost all of the operating system on the fly from version 3.3 to version 3.4, which might have thousands of changes, including data structures, wind up on the fly while the system is running, while application programs are running, with not, without changing or stopping or interfering with the running programs. And this is you know, tricky. The model, of course, is that the person who wrote version you know, 3.4 was keenly aware of all the details of 3.3. So if there was some internal table, let's say the mount table, which was simply a linear list in 3.3, and he decided to make it a hash table in 3.4 because you, know, you could have a lot of things mounted, then he'd have to write the code for converting one data structure to the other. So you, you'd st but basically, the, you, you say, I want to do an update, and there's a manager which handles that, and the manager goes to the old one and says, OK, finish off what you're doing now. Don't take on any more work. You know, sort of queue it. And then when you're all done, let me know. And when, it, when it's done, then the manager starts up the new one. And the new one then goes to the old one and says, OK, um, I need all your data structures. And the LLVM compiler allows us to record in memory all the data structures very nicely, their types and locations. So it says to him, you know, give me your first data structure. And then he gets the first data structure, sees if, if it's identical to the old one. If so, just copies it. If not, it's got to run a routine to do a conversion from, say, a linear table to a hash table or a list or whatever the new one is, and runs that. When it's all done, the whole thing is converted. Okay? It doesn't take very long. Computers are good at that. And then when it's all finished, he tells the manager, OK, I'm ready to go live. The manager then changes all the internal connections to point to the new one, makes the new one go live, kills off the old one, and there you go. And there's a, a slight glitch of you know, maybe a couple hundred milliseconds for the application when there was no file service. But you know, they don't know that. Unless you're doing hard real time, you know, everything works. You know? And um, we think that might be interesting for applications that never want to go down. And they know that software has changed all the time. There are security fixes. And we're focusing this on the embedded world, where I think there's a lot of interest in keeping the thing running all the time. If you're running some real-time system, whether it's a radio telescope or an electric power plant or some other real-time thing, you may not want to go down for reboots once in a while. And so a system which can 
can update itself, which can repair itself, which can try to have a fairly high availability, might have a, a niche in there. We've, we've got it working in the lab now for the Beagle board, for the Beagle bone. We're about to release it for the Beagle black also, which is a really, it's like, like the Raspberry Pi, but even better. Um, so we're sort of trying to see if we can find a niche there.